So I know I'm telling a lot of stories, I'm kind of scattered a little bit, but you can sort of see the progression, sort of talk about violence a little bit, talk about establishment of the park. And now I'm going to get in the part that I really enjoy, which is the monitoring and monitoring data. And then we'll talk a bit about MPAs as a tool. And I'll kind of go off on tangents and stories and whatnot. And I added a few more slides in here about abalone because um, I think they're important. They're a good, they're a good lesson. Um, but I also want to keep it really interesting for you. I think, you, know, you guys are all staying awake, so that's great. Um, <laughs> Excellent. That's, that's a plus. That happened in the last class. I mean, one sleeper. Um, but I, I want to make it interesting for you, and I want to make it worthwhile for you, especially since I don't think you get as much marine stuff as I'd like to, I'd like to see this whole class just be marine. Um, and I know there's more and more. That's, that's coastal. You stay that's coastal, coastal if you want yeah. just marine. But, um, you know, feel free to ask questions, share stories. Um, again, if you want something for me to elaborate on, just, just mention it. That's fine. So, so again, the park and, and the, was established in 1980. The inventory monitoring program was, was started around 1980 as well. Channel Islands was selected as one of five parks to be these prototype inventory monitoring programs. And in the last decade, now almost every park in the 400 park network has an inventory monitoring program. It's expanded out. Okay. Some have been very successful, and some haven't been. Um, and a little bit of the basis behind that, I think this is an interesting, short, I'm going to keep it short, is um, we get a lot of academics that come to the Park Service that, um, <laughs> that, that want to create an academic environment. And really the Park Service is not about an academic environment. We like to ask questions, we like to do research, we collaborate with academics on a regular basis to answer a lot of those questions. But my job really is this, I'm a, like the remember Dr. Seuss when you're five, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. People ask me what I do, that's what I tell them, okay? I go and I count things, okay? I'm not asking questions, and we do a little bit of question asking, and we, we do work with researchers, and we do ask questions, but the monitoring program itself is relatively boring. So we get these academics in the Park Service, and they want to create this wonderful research and academic job, and they go out and they do the monitoring. This will become apparent in some of my slides, and they'll monitor for five years, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, and they won't see a lot of change. Can you imagine if you're monitoring trees that live to be 500 years old? Lichen. Lichen, that would be, well, I like it actually pretty fast growing, some of them. But you're not going to see a lot of change in five years. So the academics get bored. And then they start taking the money and moving it towards other things that are management type questions that are important for the Park Service, but they're not the inventory monitoring program that we want the baseline data for. So unfortunately, it's still a struggle to get people to do baseline data monitoring because it is, one, outside of the National Park Service, it's almost impossible to get funding for greater than five or 10 years. And you'll see how, how that's important here in the next few slides. Um, two, people get bored with it um, in the course of their lifetime. So if um, you're studying trees and you're not gonna see a lot of change for maybe a couple hundred years and your biological career is only 30 years, you can imagine how boring it is to study just you know, a fraction of the life cycle of the tree. Okay, so still really important information and it's how to get people excited about it. And hopefully you'll be a little bit excited about inventory monitoring by the end of this talk. And, and I'll just put a plug in too that uh, we do a lot of that and a lot of our graduates do go into these programs. And unfortunately, a lot of our larger research-based universities, they're not as interested in training uh, you guys to you know, basic field skills and identifying plants and, and critters and stuff. And that's something that we actually do pretty well in the ESRM program. So if you guys haven't had the opportunity to do this, you should talk with Dave after. But also, we have m multiple projects here in California and elsewhere that do that, and it's a really good prep, and it's a fantastic resume builder for you guys. Yeah, and the stuff that the, the research station in Santa Rosa and Sean's involved in a lot of is really kind of taking up and, and doing another component of the monitoring program using utilizing students on a regular basis. So again, that information may not be so interesting, interesting for the next few years, but you'll see how it becomes interesting when you have decades of it, and then how you ask more and more questions. So when the monitoring program was set up, it was actually set up on 32 sites, all right? And you see 16 up here on the wall. Um, the red dots are our monitoring sites. And um, we, after the first year of monitoring, Gary Davis realized, oh my god, 32 is way too many. We can't monitor that many sites. It's just logistically so difficult to go out on a boat and go dive and collect all this information. Okay. So these are the 16 sites that we originally picked. Three on Santa Barbara, three on Nantapa, five on Santa Cruz. Um, there's three on Santa Rosa, this is here, and that's not supposed to be there, but there's two on San Miguel. Um, you know, two sites on San Miguel, are you really going to get a good understanding of what San Miguel's doing, which is two sites? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Um, again, if you're going to say for five years, those two sites, it's not going to tell you a whole lot. But when you start to compare 
that data with the other islands after 35 years, you start to see these patterns hold true in these, in the, in these shells. And I'm going to condense the data for you, so it'll be a little bit easier to look at. Um, quite often, these next bunch of slides are going to be all 16 of these sites combined. Okay, But again, like I told you, there's no Garibaldi here, and there's lots of Garibaldi here. So it's an overall trend at the islands, but it's not telling you the whole picture of each individual site. And there's a whole story with each site, but it still tells, it tells you the overall trend. Okay. And then in 2005, okay, um, these new marine protected areas were implemented, and they extend out the federal waters now, but they were implemented in 2003. We tried to get money before they were implemented to go get baseline data before the MPAs, marine protected areas, went into in place. We couldn't get funding. Finally got some funding in 2005, and we expanded out the number of sites to 33 sites now. Okay, so we're back to where we started in 1980s, but we got a little bit more boat support, we got more staff time, and we have those 16 sites in these four reserves. So Santa Barbara, Anti Kappa, Scorpion, and Santa Rosa. So the light green are the new sites. We pair those up with as many of the red sites as possible where they were next to it. So we didn't have, we weren't comparing apples and oranges. So really different with the biogeographical differences. Okay. So we can look at the marine reserve effects. So we're still doing long-term monitoring, but now we've adapted the monitoring program to look at marine reserve effects. And we did that in large part because um, we had the two sites here, and Kappa, in a reserve that was just 37 acres. It was established in 78 before the park was formed. And those two sites were different than everywhere else in the park. Because those were the only two sites that were protected. Okay? But two sites, if you're going to do a statistical analysis, you're going to compare two sites with your other 14 sites, it's not a significant number to really get at differences. And so we tried to publish papers. They were rejected by the scientific community. Now we've got a really robust program where we have four locations where we have at least three in and three out. Um, so really interesting how the monitoring program, again, it wasn't designed to look at specific questions, but we realized that there were some huge changes happening in that rain reserve. Um, those two sites were the impetus, though, even though the data wasn't solid enough to publish, those were the impetus of the Channel Islands getting the rain reserves before everywhere else along the coast of California. And the coast of California only has 10% protected. We have 20% protected at the park. So, here you have a monitoring program that's already costed millions of dollars, several million dollars by 2003, all right? But now it had a huge, huge benefit in protection of the islands. So a huge benefit analysis for a relatively small amount of money. Um, so this is where monitoring really comes to play as a management tool. So this is what we monitor, monitor the present. Um, so what we monitor, um, we monitor over 120 species now, with 70 original, but now we're monitoring all species of fish. Uh, vertebrates, algae, and then water temperature. And I gotta throw this part in. I love to throw this into the managers. Nope, this is equivalent to a vegetation invertebrate, a vertebrate, and a weather monitoring program all in one. <laughs> so for some reason, our society still hasn't figured it out when it comes to biological sciences that in general, with the exception of maybe marine mammals, if you're studying things in the ocean, you now have to be a jack of all trades. If you're studying things on land, you can focus on birds, you can focus on plants, you can focus on herps, soils, all kinds of things. But if you're in the ocean, they now expect you to know everything. Okay? It's highly frustrating. So I feel like I'm never an expert at anything. I know a little bit about a lot of things. And we're also doing the water temperature. There's nobody to come in and, and, and get the temperature, their temperature. So you go do studies in Santa Monica Mountains, you can get plenty of weather service data on what, what those areas are like temperature-wise. But if you're in the ocean, you now have to do it all yourself. We're actually collecting lead meter data as well. So I'd like to throw that out to you. you know, it's, we're, we're on a really tight budget. We're also, this, our program is the most expensive program in the park service. So believe me, I've got management coming down to me all the time saying. In all the park service? All yeah, the, I, think, I think we are the most expensive wow. program in the entire park service. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, boat support. The boat support is hugely, hugely mm -hmm. costly. So I got management always coming down to me, why is it so expensive? I'm like, okay, well, you try and do this, not all underwater. And so it's, yeah, I use that sort of as an argument point, but you're constantly trying to justify your programs. All right, so is monitoring this simple? Yeah, I told you this is what I do. This is doc I should have a picture of Dr. Seuss up here. But, okay. <laughs> and the answer is no, it's really not that simple. Um, we have a whole list of protocols, and so when you're diving, so those of you that are scuba divers, when you go underwater, if you're at 60 feet and you're in regular air, you've got about 50 minutes of bottom time before your blood is saturated with nitrogen, and you've got to come up and get rid of that nitrogen before you get a bubble formation in it creates a blood, uh, blood flow issue where you become paralyzed and whatnot. You don't <laughs> want to have those things happen. I mean, those are bad things. So 
We go down, if you can imagine, you're going down and you've got an hour to do all your work. Okay? Before you come up and spend a couple hours on deck and then you go back down again. And so we have very, very restricted protocols that you go down, they focus you underwater, they focus what you do, and they focus the, the animals that you do. And so these are varying on sizes. Some of these are quadrats. Um, um, so the first thing is to go diving. All right, fine, get boat, go out there. So we go out on five-day trips. So I go out on Monday, come back on Friday, every other week from May to October for 11 trips. We go find the transect line. So these are permanent sites. that are marked by a piece of lead line that's bolted into the bottom. We have to replace it about every 10 years, depending on the site, sometimes 15. And the first thing we do is we lay a meter tape. It gives us a point of reference. And then we go down there with data sheets that have random meter marks on here. And quadrats are these one square meters. So about that big. And we put them down at 24 locations along the line. So just we have 24 square meters, and we count things that are really high abundance, like sea urchins, which are not high abundance right now. Um, and sea stars, and sea cucumbers, and whatnot, and kelp plants. All right. For other species that are really rare, so we, we cover that 100 meter transect, 24 square meters. For other species that are rare, um, we do band transects in 5 meter quadrats. These cover um, 720 square meters along that 100 meter line, and 200 square meters along the 100 meter line, depending on how abundant these animals are in general. So abalone we monitor on band transects, and kelp plants actually we now monitor on five meter quadrats. So we did a review of the program 15 years into it, we realized that we weren't monitoring kelp very well. Because those quadrats, we weren't covering enough area to monitor kelp, and we had to cover a larger area. So we altered the monitoring program. We've gone through several reviews like that. Um, this is what it looks like underwater. Here's your 100 meter long transect, and there's quadrat placement, and there is band transect placement. So essentially they're just different areas that you have different types of search images for the, for the different critters. All right, and then we do random point contacts. This gives us a percent cover. How much of the bottom is red algae, brown algae, or covered with little stars, or bryozoans, or whatnot. And a diver goes in. They've got an emergency spare air here. They've got a umbilical line that's connected to the surface of so this box here where we actually have communications and can talk to the diver in the mask. They have this set a pole with two strings, and there's five knots on each of those strings, and we do 10 points here, 10 points there, it goes on the other side of that meter tape, 10 here, 10 there, 40 points. And the person is rattling off faster than Sean and I can talk, and calling out data for the person up here who's hiding from the sun and the flies, recording data. Um, so only one diver underwater, one person up here recording the data. We get about a six to one ratio. If we were to send divers underwater that would look at a point, go to their slate and record, it would take us six hours underwater for every hour of work it takes us on that. So it's an efficient use of, of technology. Um, this was implemented in 82. This actually, then you all, all heard of the Channel Islands Live program. I know some of you have. Um, you can go watch the Channel Islands Live where someone, a diver goes in and does a, a, essentially a, a nature talk underwater. For the public, it gets broadcast into a lot of the schools all around, all around the country now and around the world. Um, we use the same technology to do that underwater live dive program. So things have sort of spun off from the program. Size frequencies, we do a lot of measuring. Okay, we want to know if there's a lot of older individuals in a population or a lot of younger individuals. Um, and that helps us get to the question of recruitment. So I'm going to try and teach you this concept. If I get half of you, I'll be happy. So if you don't feel like you quite get it, sorry. You can ask me later. I'll try and explain it again. I refine the way I explain recruitment to people over the years. But how many of you think you understand recruitment in the biological sense? Not, we're not talking about recruitment in the Army. We've not recruited a bunch of people. Okay. Sean does, okay. I think so. Okay. Do you want to try and explain it? You don't have to. Yeah, I'll give it a go. Okay. So recruitment would be bringing in new juveniles. But like before I get to that stage, mm -hmm. the larvae stage, I guess, where we come into an area and then form and grow from there in that area? Yeah. Exactly. So this is a kelp recruit. This is about an inch. Sorry, I don't want to scale here. That's about an inch big. All right. And this would be a recruit for a larger individual. So it would grow up and become an adult, adult animal. All right. I'm going to go through a series of definitions. Okay. And this is really why we have to think outside the box and management. Is 30 years ago, I mean, people didn't start diving until the 50s, really. 30 years ago, people really thought that things in the ocean worked like they do on land, where we tend to have a lot more regular, and that's not always the case on land, but a lot more regular, regular recruitment. So in the case of deer, 
if we go out and we're going to manage the deer population, they do aerial surveys, they do site surveys, and you get an idea that you've got 100 female deer in an area, okay? And each of those female deer in a normal year is going to have one or two fawn. And so you know you can hunt X number of deer every year and not impact the population. And then if there's a drought year, you adjust how many deer you can hunt because you know that instead of two fawn, you're only going to get 0.5 fawns because some of them will fail, and you adjust how much you can hunt. Pretty simple on that. We did the same thing in the ocean, presuming that recruitment, the number of babies, was the same every year. Well, it turns out in the last several decades, not only is it not the same every year, but sometimes species have recruitment failure or no babies or no, or no babies grow up to be adults for a decade or two at a time. Okay, so think about the consequences if that's how you're managing your resources and you're actively hunting them and you have no babies pop up for a decade or two. All right, it's an impact of resources. So I'm going to go through a series of definitions and I'll give you a couple more examples. We'll see if this makes sense. Okay, so definition of recruitment. This is the best I can find. I don't know if I necessarily like it, but it's a number of new juvenile fish, so these little tiny one-inch long fish, okay, invertebrates or algae that reaches the size where they are represent adults or are reproductive. So they become bigger, all right? So when you're this small, there's a really high mortality, okay? And it's kind of a one of a Russian roulette game to actually settle out in the kelp forest, all right, become a little tiny fish, and then conditions have to be right, there has to be food, you have to not get eaten to become one of these, all right? And there's a lot of variability. So it's funny, somebody asked me about kelp bass in here, and I get kelp bass as the example, but this, this, this it could be with any species. Okay. No. And so an example for an abalone is this is about a one and a half year old abalone. This would be a recruit, right? An abalone and fish, an adult abalone will spawn in the millions of eggs. Okay. And they broadcast spawn. Most animals they release eggs and sperm. They fertilize and then they float around anywhere. If you're a lobster, 10, 13 months. If you're an abalone, six days to a month. Okay. And they got to make it back to the right habitat to survive, which is why they release so many eggs. Hopefully some will make it back, all right? If you have a replenishment of one. Or you also have more often where conditions might be really good for those millions of eggs, and you get thousands that all of a sudden settle out. And you have this one really successful year, which then holds the population for a long time to come. This is about a 10, 12, 13-year-old abalone. This would be a legal size abalone if, if there was a fishery today. So it takes 10 years to grow up. So low or no recruitment would be like, okay, you have only a few or no fish, and 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 none of them appear as adults, so that would be no recruitment. Yeah. Recruitment failure would be you have a lot of these little babies, but they all die. They all get eaten. Okay, so none of them were successful. You have no adults. Poor recruitment would be you have a lot of those little babies, all but one get eaten, and so you have one adult out there in the population from that year. And then successful recruitment, which happens, but very sporadically for most species, where you got little babies and nothing eats them, there's lots of food out there, and they all become adults, and you have these what we call the size cohort, these cohorts of, of sizes that kind of move through the population. Okay. So if you can imagine, if you can imagine if you got an abalone that's 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and the conditions are only good for abalone in certain temperature regimes when the currents are just right, but you're producing, this abalone is producing millions and millions of eggs every year. All right, in the sperm, they, let's say they all fertilize, okay? But not every year do you get a bunch of little bees, and not every year is there not a lot of octopus that eat all these, so you rarely get this sort of event happen. So in the case with abalone, this species tends to like cooler water. It's a red abalone. It's one of our species that does better along our coast than the other species, and I'll talk a little bit more about abalone soon. Um, if you're fishing these pretty intensely for 10 years, and again, this is about a 10 year old abalone, so every one that reaches legal size was taken. But you had 10 years of recruitment failure. You eat all these. There's now no more adults to reproduce. And now there's no more of these. Okay? That's essentially where we are with abalone populations along the coast. It's essentially what happened with black sea bass populations. It's what happened with Boccaccio, a lot of the rockfish populations, is we harvest and harvest and harvest and harvest. Don't wait for that Russian roulette game where we have a good recruitment event, and then there becomes no adults. And then we're back to like ground zero and populations we build, but it doesn't take 10 years to do it. It takes decades to do it because now those last few adults have to have a good year to get a few of these and then it's this, this pyramid scheme. Make sense? Okay. But from a management perspective of the oceans, we took those deer populations, applied it to the ocean and it didn't work. Okay. So now we're scrambling to do things like 
drastic things like have protected areas. Because most of our fishing regulations do not manage populations like we manage our deer populations on land. If that was the case, we'd probably have pretty robust populations of animals underwater. But we don't, and we continue to fish that way. So recruitment, this is another methodology that we, have, we applied. Um, these were initially set out to look at abalone recruitment, hence the name ARMS, abalone recruitment modules. Um, we now change them to artificial recruitment <laughs> modules because they're actually better for a lot of other species than they are for abalone, so we changed the name back in 1990 when I showed up. And we go down there, they're essentially a, a, like a lobster cage. They're filled with these half standard blocks. So it's a way to look underneath rocks in a standardized way. So what we discovered from our monitoring is we're just counting things on the surface. And we don't, we tell all our staff you can't turn over a rock. Because there are people in this room like Sean that can turn over a boulder this big. And I guarantee you I can only turn over a boulder like this big, <laughs> this big because he's stronger than me. And so how do you standardize it every year? You can't do it. So it's a way of standardizing boulders. So every year we go back to these cages. There's 10, of the, there's 10 sites of the 33 that have these. I wish we had a little more, but they're very time consuming. And we take all the animals out. Sometimes we measure them underwater, but quite often there's too many of them. We bring them up on deck and we measure them. Okay. So here's all these little big urchins. So we're up on deck. It takes you about anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour to, to, to pull all the animals out of one recruitment module, depending on how many urchins there are on them. And uh, we Only mobile them. guys, right? What was that? Only mobile. Uh, it's all of our indicator species. So not all mobile guys. Okay. It's, it's the sea stars, the sea urchins, the calories. Um, and we measure. So this is the boring part of our job. So my thumb, after every trip, is sore from using a caliper. Um, it's raw. It's like the, you know, the thumb, the fingerprint on your phone, mm -hmm. to turn on your phone. I can't do that after a five-day mm -hmm. golf course trip. My fingerprints are completely worn out. <laughs> and you measure, and you do this for 30 years, and you get a graph. This is so exciting, isn't it? <laughs> so 30 years, you get a graph. That's great. So you know, don't build a house. You know, so that's the most rewarding for the world. So, but this is pretty exciting. So this is just the purple sea urchins less than 15 millimeters. So this is about a one-year-old urchin. And you can see here we started in 1992, and this is Anna Kappa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa. The different color lines are the different sites where we have these. And you can see really, in this period, there's only this really one recruitment event that happened across the board, okay? Soon after this event happened, this happened right after the El Nino in 97, 98. And here, all of our kelp force disappeared and became sea urchin barons, all dominated by sea urchins. So here you have, this is what controlled with the recruitment. We didn't see it in our data until here, because we weren't monitoring the little ones. We now know sort of when the recruitment events happened and what they're associated with. So really interesting information and helps from a management perspective, also helps you predict things. And then you'll notice here, Cathedral Cove and Landing Cove, this is that one area that's been that reserve since 1978, okay? And we have relatively stable recruitment um, happening in that reserve. So really different, so the urchins were always kept in check there because a lot of predators and eat urchins, but we've also had more recruitment there at the same time. So it seems like a much healthier system. But we're seeing that show up elsewhere at the other, at the other sites as well. All right, so this is where I kind of shift the talk a little bit, and I think I got another slide to remind me to use it to have a bathroom break, but we already did that. But, um, <laughs> so great, you go collect all that. Sorry, back a little bit. Um, so great, you get, you go collect them. That's the protocols that we do. There's some information on recruitment. And then if you're doing this for 35 years, again, it's like those trees. If you're studying trees for 35 years that literally 500 years old, you're probably not gonna see a whole lot of change. Maybe you will, because of disease events and whatnot. But it's a little bit harder to detect change for species that live 500, 1,000 years old. But you hope for animals in a really dynamic environment, like in the ocean, that we see a lot of change. So I'm just going to describe a bit of the change that we saw for a couple species. Um, white sharks. Do you think this is the change we've seen with white shark populations? How many of you think we monitor white shark populations? Raise your hand. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. I've seen one white shark in the last 27 years. Okay. So we, we don't really effectively monitor white shark populations. They're, they're avoiding us. Um, so this is the white shark in the kelp forest, which is sunflower stars. Okay, <laughs> these are our top predator. Now that otters are removed, these are amazing animals. Um, they get to be about that big. If there was one that was twice that size and you laid on the ground long enough, it would eat you. They eat everything. Okay, <laughs> they eat anything they get their arms on. They're pretty amazing animals. And you can see there's been a lot of fluctuation. Not too many in the early 80s when the monitoring program started. Um, increased, then decline, and then increased again. And you can see. 2014, it's not that there's no data, it's because there's arrows, because the sea star wasting disease event happened. Okay? So the last two years, the lowest abundance we've ever seen. And if you look at the decade before, 
It was the high abundance, okay? But look, so here, if I gave this lecture on this side of the graph here, you'd be hearing me talk about all these ideas and concepts I thought were happening, okay? And they're still hold true today, but my perspective will be really different than it is today. All right. And then, again, the last two years, we're seeing the lowest abundance we've ever seen for this species. So pretty exciting when it comes to data um, and how I've given this talk when I talk about two stars. And I'll talk more about the disease and whatnot and what's driving these in a second. So go to another species of sea star, bat stars. Similar pattern. Okay. Um, we had a few more back in, in the 80s. Um, sunflower stars weren't added to the program until 1983, um, in large part because they weren't too abundant. Um, so that's why there was no data that last one. So a lot of sea stars here, they decline, increase, decline, increase. Again, highest level just a few years ago that we've seen in 35 years. And then they did disappear like the other sea stars do, the wasting event. I think these were not really affected by the disease event. They were affected, though, by a warm water event, which I'll talk about now. Um, and this species, uh, everybody thinks that the disease event for sea stars, because it hit the media just this last year, is a new thing. Okay, we've been docking disease events at the Channel Islands um, and I have a published paper, published, a paper published 16 years ago um, on, on these types of cycles. It's not a new thing at the Channel Islands. We have warm water event, the animals essentially um, get a bacterial infection and literally melt in front of your eyes in about a week or two week period. So temperatures above 69 degrees. Right? This, is a natural, this is a natural cycle, as anybody knows, it's not man-made or human-made. Populations tend to increase when you have high abundances of, of animals. You know, they're more susceptible to disease events because it's easy and contagious, just like when the cold runs through the college, everybody gets it, everybody gets sick, or you go home to your family and somebody's sick, everybody gets it. Right? And then, boom, disease event happens, building of the population, another warm water event kills off some, you get a decline, building of the population, another big warm water event, this 97, 98 El Nino, and then we have cold water for 14 years. All right. So huge increases of, of the species, and then another big warm water event, and it dropped down. Okay, surprisingly, it didn't go lower than it did, considering how much warm water we had. But there's just variation in, in, in how these things, how these happen. All right, um, now we're going to look at what the recruitment data tells us. All right, so that's this is the same as the, the last chart here. Okay, except I removed six of the original 16 sites, and now we're just looking at the 10 sites that have those artificial recruitment modules where we're going to add recruitment. All right. and this is interesting because everybody thinks that sea stars are gone. Okay? Because the, what did you see in the media for the last few years? Sea stars dying off. Sea stars, all the headlines. Okay? It was the most publicized marine disease event, and actually is the biggest marine disease event ever documented on the planet. Okay? So really significant, really exciting, but these things are pretty common with Channel Islands. And if we look at recruitment, we only have the recruitment data from 1992 when we put the arms out. And these are animals that are less than, um, I think it's 30, oh, for here, these are, these are probably less than uh, 25 millimeters. Um, and we overlay it, you see that there's a lot of recruitment, okay? And you see the, decline, the population decline, you see less recruitment, but it's still relatively high. So when you still have a lot of little babies, what are you going to expect? You're going to expect the population to come back relatively quickly, which sure enough, it does, all right? And again, a lot of high recruitment for bat stars. No problem, really. And then sure enough, here we have a really low level and the recruitment's still high. So what do I expect to happen this year? I wish I, I, we just finished collecting our data last month, so I don't have it for you. But this, this probably went up to about here, okay? So from that recruitment information, we're gonna predict that bat stars are gonna come back relatively quickly, all right? Probably no bat star population issue, all right? What about sunflower stars? So here I have a situation where same thing happened with sunflowers. They got these warm water disease events here. Those populations declined. They increased another warm water event here. Really high abundance, and again, these are really important predators. So when this happens here, they eat all the urchins, and we have nice, healthy kelp forests. And then, boom, they crash. So what we expected to happen here is urchins to dominate the world again, and all of our kelp is going to disappear. Okay? <coughs> That's what's happened in the past. Um, I'm not going to show you data on this, so I have to tell you the story. What happened this year, along with the, or these two years with the sea star sign off, the sea urchins also don't do too well in during warm water events, and they were diseased, and they all died off. So we actually have the lowest density of sea urchins, red and purple sea urchins, than we've seen in 35 years. So my expectation was, oh god, the sea stars are gone, we're going to have urchin dominated areas again, and we'll have no kelp for us. The exact opposite has happened. 
because all the sea urchins were diseased too. Biggest disease event we've ever seen, from San Miguel always to Santa Barbara. And now we have kelp forests in places like Santa Barbara Island, which haven't had kelp since the 80s, 35 years. So just dramatic changes from these disease events. As far as we know, they're natural events happening. All right, but you gotta remember, disease events happen when populations are really high. If we had sea otters, lots of big sheephead, lots of big lobster, those sea urchin populations probably would have never gotten too high and you probably wouldn't have had a massive die-off because you have a totally different system like what you have in the reserves. Okay? So we're starting to get a handle on these sort of um, more intact ecosystems with marine reserves, but they're relatively new. They're only 10 years old. Okay? So sure enough, if we look at recruitment of sunflower stars here, again, this is a little bit of recruitment that goes on. It, it, it redu when those populations went down, it also got reduced really, really significantly, but the population builds slowly over time. Does that bounce back as much as bat stars? Do bat stars tend to be a little bit more fagun? We see more reproduction happening. We're a little bit more in their perfect habitat, um, whereas sunflower stars are cold water species. And then, sure enough, here the population declined, and we saw not a single baby bat uh, sunflower star last year. Okay. So, what is that going to tell me about the future for sunflower stars? You think they're going to come back next year, or the next year later, or the year after that, like it did in these other events? Okay. If I had to predict the future, I would say no. Okay, because recruitment is so low, I think it's going to take a much longer period. It's like fishing out the abalone when you got rid of all the adults. So it takes you a lot longer to get a whole bunch of these to come back to this. Okay, so I think that's what's going to happen with the sunflower stars. There's actually a group that wants to list it as an endangered species. There are pop pocket populations of these, and we see a few. I talked to the fishermen. As far as I can tell, from San Nicolas Island to Santa Barbara, we've seen three, maybe sunflower stars this whole past year. Okay. I didn't see a single one. Here's Pisaster gigantius. Um, the other species that we monitor, again, it's just those 10 sites that we have arms. I didn't show you this data previously. But similar patterns, they get diseased, but a little, little bit different. And we're at the lowest density we've ever been at here, okay, through these great declines. And if we look at recruitment, we actually still have a lot of recruitment of these because there's other populations that are source populations. And sure enough, I expect this population to rebound dramatically. We already saw a bit of a rebound in 2016, and I don't have that data for you. So pretty exciting to watch these species in the cycles. But again, in all those slides, this last 10, 15 years, if you subtract these two, were really different than the previous years. Okay? And what are you, you know, I'll talk about that when I talk about snails. Um, so in the snails now, I've only heard snail. How many of how many of you know what an abalone are? You obviously know what an abalone is. Okay. How many of you have seen a live abalone? If you haven't seen a live abalone, raise your hand. Outside of an aquarium. A few, okay. So if you were in, you haven't seen one either? Not outside of okay. an aquarium. Okay, okay. wow. Well. Mariculture facility. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, interesting. So if you were around in Southern California in the 1970s, um, quite often hamburger stands would actually sell abalone hamburgers. So they were so prevalent in our culture just 40 years ago that you used to, on a regular basis, be able to get a fried slab of abalone meat put on a bun instead of a salmon burger, you got an abalone burger, okay? That doesn't happen today. There's no fishery form except for recreational fishing in Northern California is because we fish them all out and disease as well. So here's the abalone populations. Um, 1983 when we started counting them and they were look like they're really abundant. They actually are two abundance. But it, and then they declined. Okay, the fishery was closed here. In large part, um, the state closed the fishery because we had the monitoring data. The only other information that the state had was fishery dependent data, which is data that is um, given to the fisher, or given to the state by the fishermen. Okay, but that I'll explain why that doesn't work in, in, a, in a couple slides. So that data is a little bit flawed in that um, there's more incentive to catch the last remaining few because they're worth a lot of money. And you can see here again, we wiped out all the adult pink abalone. And they pretty much stayed at zero. We're starting to see a few individuals come back. And these probably are coming from Lardy. They're coming from Mexico and Catalina and La Jolla. So they're making this long distance transport where we've seen the larvae come in and settle as our first few adults. Hopefully those adults will grow up and, and spawn and, and, and not perpetuate a population locally. But these are virtually non-existent at the, at the Park Islands today. What's interesting is here, the monitoring start here, is you've got to keep in mind, there's a huge fishery for these. 30 years prior, 20 years prior, we don't know how high this population is supposed to be. We have no idea what the baseline for pink abalone is 
at the channel entrance. There is no data. Okay, so we're, this is a common case with almost all of our species. So I talk about baseline data, right? This is our shifting baseline. This is the best perspective that we have because there's no information prior to this. There are some abalone species we have absolutely no information about, like white abalone. Here's red abalone. This is one of our species um, in California. There's seven of them. That actually is doing relatively well. It's still not existent in a lot of areas that it used to be very abundant. Um, this is um, th there, it's more of a cooler water species, so it's pretty common around Santa Rosa, San Miguel, in the red and the orange. But these other islands, it was always pretty rare after there was a few. Um, we just have two sites on San Miguel. On one site has abalone, the other one doesn't. So this is all just one site here. But here you had Modern densities, this is also one of the most heavily fished areas of anywhere in the Channel Islands, okay? But it still had a relatively low, low level of a population of abalone, even though the harvest was really intensive. So this species looks like you could probably deal with a fair intensive harvest, but you remove fishing, and sure enough, what does this do? It skyrockets. So again, we don't know what this was supposed to be like here before the monitoring started, so we don't really know what the baseline is. Um, so this is where I'm gonna, I added this happened last night at like 9 o'clock in the office. So they sent me a, a, a recent slideshow. Um, and I decided to add it in there because I think I've only a, a fun discussion. Um, seven species in California. These are the ranges. You don't have to know too much about this. Um, Claire probably will not ask you questions about this because she hasn't seen this part of my talk. But who knows? Maybe she'll watch the video and that's something. <laughs> so, hi, Claire. Anyways. Um, Six of these species, I'm sorry, five of these species are either endangered, the black abalone and the white abalone, and a lot of that information came from the park, actually most of that information for these animals to be listed came from the park services monitoring programs. So again, we're monitoring these things, the state owns and manages the resources, but they don't have the information they need to manage them appropriately. So we help petition to have these species listed and protected, and then we use our data to, to show that. And then these other three species here um, are species of concern. Um, these two species here, green and pinks, are starting to come back in some areas like Catalina and La Jolla. Um, Pinot abalone are a really inter interesting species. I was on the committee to list that species, and we kind of um, decided not to. Um, it's a species of concern, but it's doing pretty poorly in some areas, but it's a very sporadic um, species. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about white abalone here. Oh, I oh, said so cultural importance of abalone. This is why I don't know the slides, because they just showed up last night. So, <laughs> huge history of the cultural importance of abalone and, and humans um, all around the world, ever since humans started using ocean resources um, in, um, in China and Japan and whatnot. But in California, they were harvested. There was huge trade with these red abalones. This is a red abalone hidden on um, probably either Miguel or San Nicolas. I think it might be San Nicolas. And those abalone shell pieces were found all over the U.S. They were often traded as beads, as um, fish hooks, as... as um, points um, as jewelry. So a huge amount of trade going on. Um, and then this is a book that came out recently. Uh, modern fishing pressures, so not just in the past, 13,000 years ago. What we get into, this is a, a slide from Santa Barbara, um, 1920 postcard. And there were huge fisheries in the Santa Barbara coast, all from, mostly from the islands. And those are piles and piles of abalone shells. They're starting to sort through. They made buttons out of the shell material and whatnot. So they were used. But pretty amazing. This is all up and down the coast. Monterey has photos like this. Morro Bay has photos like this. So pretty, pretty amazing harvest. And there aren't this many abalone left anymore. Okay. Um, just last month, I was out with um, a group of people, a whole bunch of different organizations, and we monitored San Nicolas Island. Mainly looked for white abalone there for the Navy. It's an endangered species. They can't do certain activities around the endangered species. So we spent 10,000 minutes or 173 hours underwater, this group of people, 13 sites around the island, and we covered 20 acres of ocean bottom, and this is how many abalone we found. We found 21 red, red abalone, one pink abalone, not too many. Not a whole lot of abalone left at San Nicolas either. So that's a really far island away, but again, over-harvested and disease has, has tackled the species to today. This is just information from last month. So here's that commercial landings, um, the fishery-dependent data that I was telling you about. So the value is in red, and you can see yeah, low value back here, I think they were worth 50 cents a piece, okay? When the fishery closed, you were getting $100 a piece for each abalone. And you can see how that value increased and it stayed relatively stable, even though the catch was declining, okay? And so here you have the fishermen telling the state, don't close the fishery, because what? They're still making a lot of money, all right? But look at the population level. 
And our data showed the same thing. If you look at the, the fishery independent data, it shows that those populations have crashed. So this is what happens with fisheries everywhere in the world. Okay? So people always ask me, what fish is the best fish to eat? What do you think my answer is? Chicken. <laughs> no fish. Oh, sardines. Sardines and anchovies. Okay? And so what I tell people, you know, I, you can go to the Monterey car, there's some, there's some truth to the Monterey Bay, you know, uh, you've all seen the Monterey Bay fish card and what seafood are, watch. Is, the, the seafood watch, what fish are, are better to eat than, than less good. And I tell people that if you really are concerned about a resource and how many there are in the wild, well, first of all, you shouldn't be eating, eating wild things, okay? You saw the human population grow? We are eating everything, okay? Sorry, we've got 8 billion people on the planet, we're eating everything. All right, it's that simple. All right, so we're fishing down this low, tiny percentage at a really high value. So you go to the supermarket, what is the most expensive protein in the supermarket? More expensive than flay and milk. It's the seafood. Why is the seafood so expensive? There's not a lot of that. And rich people think that they're healthy to eat for them, but not for the environment. It's real simple. Don't eat the seafood. Okay? So I like seafood. I catch a little bit of my own. I'm being a little bit facetious here, but think about those consequences and think about these things. If there is a high cost value to something, it's probably because there's not a whole lot left in the environment. And that's the case with, with almost all of our, our ocean resources. So here's my abalone. There was a big boom in bus fishery for them. This is a species that I started doing oral histories of fishermen that were diving in the 50s to try and figure out a baseline of what used to be there in the 50s because nobody documented anything. And nobody collected any scientific data on abalone until around here, after the species was already completely harvested out. So what it looks like with white abalone, the best information we have is there are a whole lot of these big giant adults. They probably live to be 50, 60, 70 years old. And we went through this whole period here where the fishermen didn't even see any little tiny babies. There's one or two accounts, and there's shell collectors around the world that die to have little baby white abalone. And there's only a few hundred in people's collections because they don't exist. Nobody was saw any babies in this whole period. So boom, you go down there, all your abalone are these big old eagle flies animals, and you take them all. And then sure enough, you're here, you have no adults to reproduce, so that's where we're at today. They're endangered. Tanner Bank has got maybe a few thousand, and they're virtually extinct everywhere else. And we have a abalone recovery management plan because it's an endangered species, a lot of effort into these sorts of documents and, and legal components. And now there's a recovery strategy where we've got a few animals in captivity, we're breeding them. We've finally, after 20 years, learned how to successfully breed them. It's still really hard. Red abalone are super easy to breed. Whites and blacks are really hard to breed. And now we're at the point where we're trying to figure out how we could, we could populate the coast in the, within the range, okay? We're at a really beginning level of this and it's hard to get hundred or two hundred thousand dollars to do this sorts of things, which doesn't go a long way. Okay, so but this is what's being attempted with white abalone right now. It's pretty much a last ditch effort to save the species. All right, wavy turbine snails. Everybody good? Everybody with me? Okay, so um, sort of talking about fisheries. Park Service really I do long term monitoring. I don't want to talk about fishery science, but it has a lot of relevance to. to why we monitor management actions that the state takes or doesn't take. Um, this species, nobody would consider eating, well, the Native Americans, the Chumash ate them, but modern people really would not eat them up until 30 years ago, 20 years ago. But as abalone became more expensive, here's a green of, a can of green or pink abalone that came from Mexico. Those are about $100 a can. You can buy those in, in various places in LA and San, San Francisco. Um, or you can buy a abalone like shellfish, which are often squid or wavy turban snails or locos from Chile for about 10 to $15 a can. Okay? So you can see the attractiveness of buying an abalone like shellfish versus an abalone can. And so there's become a fishery for wavy turban snails. So let's say you're going to leave here and you want to go to graduate school and you're interested in doing fisheries management stuff and you want to pick this as a topic and you want to monitor the population of wavy turbine sales to see if there's a potential viable fishery. So let's say that's your question. So you go out and you monitor things. And you do it from 1982 to 1986, five years. All right? You're in a five-year program for a grad student. It should be four. People often take, I don't know, two. It should be two. Oh, for masters. Masters, yeah. For masters. So let's say you're doing a PhD. It should be five, four or five. 
people take some time. <coughs> and let's say you're really lucky, you land this NSF grant that's going to pay for all your college, pay for all the work, pay for everything for, for five years. And you go out and start counting all the animals, and you think, wow, when I first started in this guy's tent, there was 0.5 per square meter, and it increased to 1.5. Wow, we could have a fish rate for these, no problem. Okay, there's a lot of them, and they're increasing population. Okay, so most research is happening at those levels. People get funding for one, two, three, five years if they're lucky. All right, and nobody else, nobody else has long-term monitoring. Let's say you did the next five years, your answer would have been exactly the opposite. The population's crashing. No, we can't have a fishery for these. So it's not viable. Or the next five years, similar to the first five years, and the next five years, there's a whole lot of them. You probably have a fishery, but there's a lot of variation. And the next five years, there's fewer. You probably won't be able to have a fishery at the Channel Islands. And then the next seven years, again, this really low level. And you can see where the long-term data really comes into play and how it changes the story. And you look at the cycles. This is similar to see what happened with um, bat stars, but it's sort of the opposite, um, where this species tends to do better during warm water years, but there's a lag effect here. All right, I'll explain that in a second. Where this is a warm water species, you don't see too many of this in San Miguel, but during these warm water events here, what we actually see is not a die off, all right? We see a recruitment event. You see a lot of little tiny babies, which I'm not showing you the data here, I'm not showing the size data. And those become adults, and you see those in the population, and then they just die off to either predation or old age, and then you have a warm water event happen, and that's what's driving the system. And then you have this 15 years of cold water, and the population is the lowest it's ever been. Okay? And then we have a big warm water event, last two years, and I think this year it's going to be about up to here again. Okay? I haven't been able to look at the data. So um, instead of crashing during the warm water years, we see recruitment events, and there's a small lag effect that happened. Um, but you can see, if you're going to open a fishery for these, we know enough about the biology that you're not going to have a very long-lived viable fishery. So if you are going to try and fish these manage sustainably, you're going to have to fish them probably at a really low level or rotate areas or do something really creative to not have those populations crash. Okay. And I would say that also, as I worked on this species when I was in graduate school, and in the 90s, the, what we used to call the Department of Fish and Game, the State Department, listed them on a list of the 10 most underexploited marine resources. Yeah. So they were really, so the state agencies were really encouraging people to think about these as a potential fishery. Yeah. And in, in large part because those abalone populations were crashing. Right. And they wanted people to switch to some, some alternative. I forgot you worked on these. So. All right. And then there's, like, and then there's our orange puffball sponges. This is a species that I'm embarrassed to talk about, but I like talking about it because <laughs> it embarrasses me. Why are you embarrassed? I don't know. So if I was talking to you here, all right, so this species was picked because it's this bright orange filter feeder. And so when the program first started, we tried to get top feathers. We try to get primary producers like kelp, and we try to get low-level filter feeder types of organisms. So the whole spectrum of the ecosystem. And it's bright orange. So it's really easy to teach people to identify these. And there's no misidentification for the sponges, which are really confusing. Except they aren't always bright orange, and they're most often covered with sediment or algae, and they're like one of the most cryptic organisms down there. <laughs> so I hate this as a, as a leader of the program. Is I gotta teach people to get the search of it for this round blob that's on the bottom that could be bright orange or could be pretty much red from algae or completely brown. All right, and so here I'm like tearing my hair out trying to get people to count these things, okay, and to do it right and get the search image for them, and I'm seeing no change. And I'm thinking, why are we counting this? I'm not seeing any change for 20 years. This is the dumbest thing in the world. Okay, well, you gotta remember, here we had normal conditions or cooler conditions, okay? We had a fair number of these when we started, and then they dropped right during that warm water event, and they stayed relatively low level, really gradual changes, and then we hit this cooler water regime, okay? And boom, the population skyrocketed. And then we're seeing warm water, and actually this year I think it's going to go down even a little bit more. Okay, so this species looks like it's sort of like the canary in the gold mine, but doesn't have all these really abrupt changes with these disease events and this warm water, cold water. It's a more gradual change, and I think this is a really good indicator of ecosystem health or at least the status of these areas. Maybe not health, per se, but what's going on in the ecosystem. So I think you can actually monitor this species alone, and it will tell you a lot about all these other species. So my story has completely changed, and it's like <laughs> I, I can't wait to tell people how to look for these now, because I think this data is really valuable. Um, and so it, again, your perspective changes over time and what you think is important and not important. There's a lot of species that the monitoring program Started counting in 1982, like barnacles and hydroids and uh, what's the other one? Um, 
Barclays and Heineken in England, and they crashed because of that warm water event. So there was virtually none in 1983. And they started realizing, well, we want to add some species and we want to take away species. So they took away those species from our indicator species. They added some other ones, thinking they were unimportant. Sure enough, as we go through this cooler water regime, those species are off the charts and we have no data for them. I'm dying. So we're trying to actually add, add them back to the program. It's not that simple. We're actually limited to how many things we can count by the size of our data sheet. So we're exploring with, believe it or not, Max underwater and what like that, but we're yeah, baby, yeah, but it's not working out too well. But anyways, <laughs> but we're exploring different opportunities to be able to collect more data underwater. But we're really limited physically in what we can collect underwater. All right. Um, so here's here's that temperature stuff in, in, in a little bit of perspective. Here you had all this warm water here. Here being two, um, all this anomalously warm water. Anything above the zero is warm in red. Anything below is anomalously cold. And then um, we've got more cooler water really from 1998 on. So if you look here, a lot of warm water in the first 20 years of the program, and then a lot more cool water. And then we have, you know, i got to update this a little bit, but the blob, okay, and the El Nino. And this warm water, water event is more like, goes to here, and it goes as high as that for the largest amount of time and the highest temperature ever since we started the monitoring program. And that's what's driving all these highs and lows for all those species that you saw before. All right. So if we take this and put it in the best contacts we have for the ocean, okay, unless we go into the paleontological record, which really doesn't tell us a whole lot from year to year vari variation, we get more like decades or centuries when we get into the paleontological climate change stuff. And we go to the Scripps Pier, which is our best data, data set for, for water temperature in the oceans around the whole globe. So in 1900, when people used to, when Scripps Pier was established, People used to go out there with a bucket, they lower it down, they put the thermometer in the bucket, they pretty much do that today. They have a few sensors that do it, they, they calibrate them. This is the longest set of data we have for temperature on record. Um, that's on a, on, a, on a daily type of basis. And what you can see here, I don't have a line drawn on the new one that goes up to 2000, 2015, um, is you get a warm water event, a warm water 30 years here, and then you have another cool water here that's about 30 years, and you have a warm water that's about 30 years, and it looks like we're in this cooling phase here. So this is what we call the Pacific Decade Oscillation. But again, I challenge you when you think about this, okay, it looks like things are on a 30-year cycle, but with just 100 years worth of data, with just two cycles. We're not even in the second cool water. So you think about species like abalone that have been around for, I think red abalone has been the fossil record for something like 10 million years, or well, maybe 4 million years, I get the millions of years mixed up. 4 million years is a long time. So you think about how these populations have changed with, with climate and, and water temperature variation. Okay? They persisted for a long time. And here we are taking a snapshot, trying to base our management decisions on them. And I'll tell you what, 35 years is not very long. It's the best we have. We, you do with your best available information. But we have to take everything with a grain of salt and think about kind of the bigger picture. This is why MPAs are so important. Because we're not very good at managing things because we have so little information. So if you set aside parks and protected areas, you might have a chance at looking to see how populations change over time. And maybe 100 or 200 or 300 years from now, you'll be able to manage things more effectively in other places. Meanwhile, everything outside of a reserve or a park is being overconsumed as that human population continues to increase. A couple examples here. Um, I'm going to stop with the, with the, with the um, species data and go to MPAs. Um, these are just good examples of how here, this species was added to the program in 1996. Um, this is a warm water urchin species that has now pretty much the most dominant urchin on Anacap and Santa Cruz Island, more so than the purple urchins. And you can see this increase this last year with the warm water event. So we're seeing huge shifts in the urchin populations. Purples and reds are gone. Black urchins or Centrus stephanus have come in and are now the most dominant urchin in the system. Blue banded gobies, same thing. Uh -huh. Friend of Claire's husband works on these. Um, Mark. And so, skyrocketing the population again due to the warm water events. But I just wanted to show you the dramatic change. Here's a species that we've been monitoring really since the beginning of, um, of the program in 85. So, huge changes, unprecedented. Okay, so I actually like to sit here and I can even pick apart the individual sites and tell you the stories and how the sites have changed over the years. Um, I love the biological data. If any of you are interested in going on a master's program, you can probably take any one of our species. Actually, even if you don't want to go to a master's program and you want to write scientific papers, you can probably take any one of our species right now and write a natural history paper on it and describe its change over time, and it will get published. 
because nobody has 35 years for the data. Okay, plenty of unpublished information. If you're really interested, class projects, something like that. Our data is public. I'll tell you how to get it later. There's lots of opportunity there. Um, I don't have the time to, to do it in the office. I have the import oh, I look forward to retiring that way. <laughs> All right. Does anybody need a bathroom break? Or are we good?